let's address a few homework assignment questions. So one question that was asked is, what is the major difference between an EFF and an EFF op? So you should look at homework 7, util.reckon, and an EFF is, as we what we saw before, is basically that object that we use to return uh, the state and the result. So we use it as is the return value of any effectful operation. So what is an effectful operation? An effectful operation is basically a value of type EFF op. So it's just a struct that contains a function. That function takes a state and produces an EFF. So examples of effectful operations are uh, EFF bind, EFF pure, env put, env get, and env push. So these are all effectful operations and therefore they are just functions that should be created inside this EFF op. So another question that someone asked me was, how do I test for if? How do I know if the term is curried? That was the second question. So the first one is you should do a pattern matching before you check for apply. So you, you have your implement, I assume you are implementing this as a pattern matching test and you should have one pattern matching test for function application. For, to answer the first question is how do I test for if is add a new pattern before function application that checks for the whole thing to be matched. And you will see in the next slide, I show you a few examples of pattern matching and hopefully they will kind of get, point you in the right direction. But the idea is that you can write nested patterns if you haven't seen already. I highly recommend you to peruse the um, record manual page on pattern matching as well. Um, and the second question is, how do I know if the term is curried? For the sake of the interpreter, the input is always curried terms. That's, that is to say, all functions only have one argument. You don't have to test that in any way. You can safely assume that all programs that are given to be executed, they only have one parameter. They, they cannot have zero or more than one. They have exactly one parameter and one argument. So all function declarations, one parameter. All function calls, exactly one argument. So these are some examples of pattern matching. Um, let me go through a few of them. So the first one is checking if X is a value, and you can use this question mark thing to do it. Another alternative way of doing the same thing is by using the pound colon when. So you write the variable that you want, and then you do when, and then you write a condition like you would in cond, uh, and then you can return whatever you want. So in this case, I'm returning X. But X is accessible here, is what, what is important. Um, so next example is, what is this? This is saying that, so let's look at this, this branch. This pattern matching is saying when you want to check that the variable name is exactly X. So it's different than here where we're defining a variable X, right? Here we're defining a variable X, a racket variable X. Here we're defining a symbol, think string. So a string that contains that is exactly x, right? Um, so it could be anything. So this is how you match if a variable has a certain specific name. Let's say you wanted to say the variable has to be this. So you could pattern match it and do quote this and that would match the variable whose name is this. Another example is here. And what is this pattern matching saying? This pattern match pattern is saying that I want a lambda that contains exactly one argument and I don't care, so the underscore is don't care. I don't care about the name, and I don't care about the body. So it's it could have as many body as whatever you want to put there. I don't really care about it. That, that's how you write it. If you do care about it, you could write a variable here to say the body instead of underscore. And here, let's say you want to say that you want to access the first parameter, you would write P or whatever name you want to call it, and you would be, it would be available in the pattern too. Um, but in this case, the only thing we're saying is because we're not declaring any variables, we're just checking the actual structure. And this is a lambda with exactly one uh, parameter. Okay, second example. We're saying that, what is this example saying? It's an example where we don't care about the environment. And 
it has to, sorry it has to be a closure uh, in which we don't care about the environment and on the right hand side we have actually a lambda that has exactly one argument and we don't know what that argument is but we're going to assign that to x and the body i'm going to call it eb okay it's very close to what you want in homework uh, seven this is another example very close to what you would want in um, homework seven as well so this is a function application which has a nested function application which has a specific variable name which has exactly one argument and i passed exactly the number one to it and here is the 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 arguments that i passed to that function are exactly a s variable with the name that i don't care that is going to be assigned to variable foo okay so it's going to be very similar to what you want to do in homework five as well so what i my advice to you is declare this and play with it pass create use parse um be parse one if i'm not mistaken to parse expressions and pass them to this put, put this code in a function right that takes an expression and pass the expression that you parse it and play around see if you can match all the the branches if you can hit all the branches and then start varying the expressions what if i call this a different name what if i add two two arguments to the list or five or what if this is a variable name, or, you know, like X, what would X be? Uh, play around with this. The only way to learn is to play with it. Okay, next example. What does this mean? <laughs> what does lambda parenthesis this comma X dot 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 parenthesis dot this? Okay, so what does this mean? This means well it means here it means whatever is here so let's look at the so where does this come from this comes from this rule right and you may be wondering uh what is this part highlighted in blue mean well this means you have to create a lambda right and this is the body of the lambda and in the body of the lambda we are recursively translating e that is given here um, and the arguments you have to convert every x which is in this font to with from the source language this x is going to be a variable in the source language you have to convert that to a variable in the target language they might have the same symbol contained but they are different structs as you will see so this is an ast for the source language so it's uh, s colon variable and this would be a j colon variable notice that you have to have to add a new parameter that has the name exactly this not a different name it has to have a name exactly called this the body of the lambda that is being defined in the part in blue the body of the lambda has to be recursive translation of e which is the body okay that's that's what this thing means hopefully that makes it a bit more clear so if you're wondering what is JS set, it appears in one of the slides. Um, JS set is just so I can write stuff that fits in the slide. So you can ignore what is set. So assume that set is just some code that is being generated by recursively translating the body. What you want to look at is what is highlighted in yellow. That is what you want to look at. Okay. Um, yeah, it's just a shorthand notation for set exclamation mark O dot F and then A. So it doesn't really matter for you. So then you may be wondering what is the difference between dollar sign proto and prototype? So dollar sign proto is that special field that JavaScript's objects have in the translation. That's what we're using to represent the linking of objects. Prototype is a special field that functions have that is used to that serves as a template for what the proto is going to be for any instance so it, it affects when you're creating an object with new so whenever you do new new is going to initialize the the proto fields of the new instance let's say small a 
with whatever you gave it in function.prototype. Okay, that's so this serves as the template prototype that is going to be copied to every new instance. Okay, hopefully that makes it a bit clear. And that's about it. That's the last question. Um, hope you have a good one and that you feel very confident to complete homework eight and seven successful in the next, in the next following days.